recover loud <laughs> Let's go I'm on a journey to discover the truth Living life and recovery is lovely You got the power in you Surround yourself with positive energy Judges hitting people with provocative penalties Need to make a change Advocate to change the laws Prove to people that it's not insane When you stand behind a cause I'm here to speak about the pain Recover loud to normalize the disease That's been killing all my friends And my family The time is now to let it all go And recover loud The benefit is healthy people Family and friends that never have to overdose ever again never have to plead out to a lesser offense i'm proud to say that i recover loud i never thought i could but i'm so proud that i discovered how to live my life again controlling my own destiny i needed recovery i still need it desperately addiction never defined my identity. i recover loud here to tell my own story i recover proud save a life of like 40 i recover loud yeah i recover loud i recover loud yeah I recover thou, I recover thou, here to tell my own story. I recover proud, save a life of like 40. I recover thou, yeah, I recover thou, I recover thou, yeah, I recover thou. I recover, I recover loud. 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 Today is National Overdose Awareness Day. One of a parent's greatest fears is that they find out that their child has overdosed and died. Today I have the honor of speaking to a mother who lost her son in 2017. Let's listen to her story. Good morning, I'm Lisa Bentecourt and I recover loud. Welcome back to another episode of Recover Loud. Today I get to sit with Lisa Bentecourt who lost her son in 2017 to a drug-related overdose. Lisa, welcome to the show. Thank you for sharing your story um, and your son's story. Um, can you just tell us a little bit um, about your son and uh, how it was for him growing up? Andrew was, um, from the get-go, he was like this little wild, bouncy thing. He just never stopped. He was a great kid. Um, we had our struggles growing up through the years. Um, but he, like, when you were his fam, when you were his friend, you were his family, and he had a huge family, uh, and when Andrew moved in with us in December of 2016, he stayed with us until he moved into his own place, um, and that, he was with us for five months, and that was the best five months of my life, his life. Um, we sat down and we did arts and crafts, we did family movie night, we did cooking, we did fun stuff, and um, he was in recovery at that time. He was trying to recover, so it was like we had our battles. So you were supportive, um, yes. but you held boundaries. Yes, you you have to you have to hold those boundaries. Yeah. Um, can you talk about the boundaries um, that you had with him uh, uh, once you knew that he was using? Um, how did you how did you set those up, and how did you keep them? Very hard because. Um, he would, he would become very verbally aggressive um, and just he would try to get whatever he wanted. You know, there's a couple times that he came into the house and took things um, in the shed, not in the house. He, would, he took stuff that was his, but we bought it and then he would take and sell it and whatnot. So we told him, you know, but if you're going to do that, you can't come here. I didn't not trust him in my house, but the outside where he had his toys and stuff. Yeah, you know, uh, I imagine that. Um, that behavior was different um, than it was when he was growing up. Um, you know, we, we become master manipulators um, during our addictions. And we hurt people, you know, that we care about and, and we really don't intend to. Um, as I was mentioning to you earlier, I don't have experience with losing a child, um, but I've been that child. Um, so I, I do appreciate your perspective on these, these questions. Uh, and I hope that uh, the viewers will will get a better understanding of, of what it's like um, to raise a child with substance use disorder. Um, if we could back up, sure. at what age, um, or maybe what year was it that you found out that Andrew was using? 
2013. Uh, he was using prior to 2013. But in 2013, um, my mom was in a nursing home in Van Buren. And I said, hey, bud, let's go up and see Nani. And I'll take you with me because you haven't seen her yet. So he said, yeah. So I went to go pick him up. He gets in the car and he looks at me and he was honest with me. And I have to just say, he always called me mommy. I always says mommy because I was mommy. So he said, mommy, so I have to tell you something. He's like, I think I need help. And I'm like, well, what do you need for help? He's like, I think I need recovery. And I'm like, what are you doing? I know that you're smoking pot. He's like, no, it's worse than that. So me, being blindsided, I had no idea what to do. I drove around where he lived. And we, we, I drove around the block. I pulled uh, uh, back in front of his apartment. And I said, you need to get out of the car. He's like, why? Aren't I going to see Nani? I said, no. I said, I need to figure out what I need to do to help you. And um, I dropped him off, and then he was very upset. I heard him that day, and he he actually wrote in one of I found a Facebook post that he wrote about how um, he went home and cried because he didn't want to hurt me or his family. So he was living with his dad. So it was you know he was a daddy's boy too. And and I'm sure I'm sure just learning that was painful for you uh, and not knowing what to do in that moment was painful um, absolutely so what was it you did um, after that uh, to try to help him so um, when I dropped him off I went and I made phone calls I called um, I, I called doctor's offices I called um, agencies I'm like I need help for my child. And at that point, he was sort of struggling even more. And he ended up in, in Acadia. Um, we had three different evaluations in two days. Sorry. <laughs> and, um, and by the last time when the, he came out holding a knife to us, the police came and brought him to the hospital. And they brought him to Acadia. And he was um, withdrawing in Acadia, one on one in an isolation pod. You know, and we weren't allowed to go see him because he was not stable at that time. Yeah, and did you say that was 2013? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, we've learned a lot since then. Absolutely. Um, you know, uh, back then, I don't know if anybody even carried Narcan. Mm -hmm. um, so it was, I mean, it was a different world than, than it is today. You know, even in 2018, when I decided to get help in Caribou, I, I had nowhere to turn. I didn't know where to turn. Um, there were resources. Uh, just nobody had ever told me where they were, yep. uh, and you know that's the the purpose of recovering loud is is so that people know that recovery is possible and there are ways to do it. Um, and you know it is a shame that you know before uh, this movement started, you know we've lost some good people. Many, many. Um, so Andrew died on April first, twenty seventeen. Never forget what I was doing, what I was wearing, whatever. Nine o'clock. I'm like, I'm gonna. Maybe I should call the intro. And I didn't. I it just slipped my mind. You know, I'm like, I get busy. You know, just carrying on doing a mom life. And then at, I want to say eleven o'clock. I get my phone rings and it's Andrew. It says Andrew's new number. And I pick it up and I'm like, Hey, bud. And it was his friend. It's like, Lisa, I think you need to come quick. I think Andrew overdosed. I had just put the, the cinnamon roll dough on the table and like when he said that I hit the floor. I fell to the floor, Bailey came running, I'm screaming, call 911, call 911, somebody get there quick, you know, oh, I'm shaking just thinking about that day. And uh, I was screaming, get him help, get him help, somebody just help him. That was the worst day of my life. The longest ride from Fort Fairfield to Limestone because he had just moved into his own apartment. And, you know, and he had been clean. So it yeah, was just... You had said that Andrew was in recovery at the time. He was. Um, how long would, had he been in and, recovery at that point? Um, he started October of 2016. Um, he ended up going to TAMIC. 
and um, I had received phone calls because he was living on his own at the time and I had received phone calls multiple times, Lisa you need to come quick, get me to Andrew at the hospital, something's going on, oh, excuse me, and then finally um, one doctor at Tamic listened and they gave him a cocktail, a, re a detox cocktail, so he slept for three days and um, after that in October he still at his house, he moved in with us in December and then he just, um, he was well. He had to go to the doctors every two weeks because he had um, ended up with hepatitis. So, you know, he went every two weeks and everything was going well. And One thing I preach is that, you know, it is important to celebrate our little victories. Um, no matter what it is, you know, if we've done something and it's noticeable to us in the moment, um, it's important for us to recognize that that is growth, you know, that is part of the process. And, you know, I, I encourage people to be proud. If, if you're able to say no to anything today, you know, be proud of that. Um, because it is, it's a big step. Um, it might not happen all day long, but that one time makes yeah. a difference. So Lisa, after, after the overdose, um, what was it like for you? So, the first day, actually the first three days, were absolutely terrible. Um, because Andrew died with his phone in his hand. I'm gonna cry. All I could think was, he was trying to call me for help. thinking, like, he needed me, and he would have called me, so I was devastated, I cried, I sobbed, I didn't sleep for days, I had people in and out talking to me, I was, when you're in, when you get that news, and when you live this life, and when you, the nightmare begins, you said and, and think, how am I going to get through this? Um, the only way, by the third day, my oldest daughter who lives in Virginia is coming home. And she has a friend who, I believe, um, communicates with people who passed. Okay. So, um, and this is like, this is just, I needed to hear this because I was completely devastated. All I was thinking, he was hollering, you know, he's calling me, I need help, mama, you know, come quick. And uh, so Chelsea called me right before she got on the plane on Monday morning and said, Mom, she's like, Renee called me. I said, okay. And she told me, that, um, Renee said, Renee wanted me to let you know that Andrew was okay. She said, somebody um, needed, somebody named Benny. Ben, Benny, you know, somebody came to her and said, you know, came with two other people, two other people, two other young men who had passed. They were there just, they needed to let me know that Andrew was okay. And I'm like, I don't know anybody named Ben. And I'm like, Ben, 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 Penny. My friend Penny who had passed. And ironically, I would get phone calls. Randomly, I'd get phone calls from Penny's number. And Andrew loved Penny. And I'm like, she, it was her way of saying, something is going to happen. But anyway, this is just right off, off topic. But uh, it wasn't because it made me feel better because Penny came through and said that um, Andrew didn't feel anything. His body went through a lot, but it was like he was sleeping. So that was like... Comforting. Yeah. I, I knew that he had just gone to sleep. So that just... But, uh, but the nightmare, like that's the beginning of the nightmare, then you have to make a decision on what funeral home you're going to go to, and are you going to have your child cremated or buried, and who's going to speak, and what songs are you going to play, and what pictures, all those things that um, you don't expect, or calling people, or his dad, like his dad was in Hawaii. 
and I remember still being at the um, where he his apartment, and I can remember his father calling me. I had like 15 phone calls, one right after another, and um, and he's saying to me, "Where's my boy? Let me talk to my boy." And I'm like, "The story didn't make it," and then and he just hung up on me, and then. I can remember seeing his friends coming in and out of the apartment or coming to the comp uh, um, apartment complex and just like hitting the ground. You know, I was just here at 9.30. I just talked to him at 9.30. So it's just, and then, and then it's been, it's been rough. It's a nightmare. It's a never ending nightmare. So, so in the early days, um, how did you find comfort? How did your recovery begin? Um, uh, I felt sorry for myself. I felt, I felt angry for a little bit. The waves of grief. Yeah. The waves of grief still happen every day. Yeah. Yesterday there was a post on Andrew's memorial page of some young man. And I shared it. And they talked about going out, setting behind the hill in the backyard and whatnot and that so that's another way which just it comes yeah. out of randomly yeah. so it's, it's, it's different it's hard so. now have you been able to find any um, outside support are you part of any, any support groups um well i have quite a few online we there's quite a few um different agents well different groups online so the support group I've, I'm in many different support groups um, this one is called team sharing and it's for the United States but this one is uh, specifically for the state of Maine and it has um, quite a few people that I know so you mentioned in these support groups uh, there are some local people that you know yes who have lost uh, can you guess how many other parents that you know from the county lost a child just that you know that I know probably ten yeah. ten if not more yeah. and the sad part about it is when a child was lost it's like reliving your loss yeah the wounds are just opened up and ridiculous so have you found um, you know, the support of other moms has helped you, and have you been able to support other moms? Um, I would say I, I feel like I've been able to support or give guidance to other people who still have children who are active in active recovery. Um, and I would, I don't want I anybody ever to be me. I don't want anybody to live this nightmare that I live because it's, it's indescribable. I can't can't even tell you the pain. I can't explain it. I guess the worst thing that, like, breaking my leg is nothing. Yeah. Yeah, we always say that, you know, one of the worst things that we could experience is losing our child. Um, and when it comes from a disease like substance use disorder, um, there's a lot of pain before the overdose. Yeah. And then when, when the person is lost, a, there, there's no healing from the pain that was caused previously. Um, so you live the rest of your life still feeling that. Um, so thankfully I don't know. Um, and honestly knowing 10 people in the county who have lost their child to an overdose, we don't expect it around here. No. People don't talk about it around here. Um, it, it's like it doesn't happen in our neighborhood. And it can happen to anyone. Anyone. Um, you mentioned one time before when we were talking that there was a you felt some blame when he passed. Have you forgiven yourself for any of that? I will never forgive myself. As a mom, I, we do so much for our children and stuff like that. But I will, like you always think you can do more. You know, like I've taken, I feel like I've taken on the responsibility of, like, I don't know, I, 
it's just such a heavy weight. I don't know if I can. Well, I think it's important for us all to remember you know, what we can't do for others. Um, you know, what we want for them. They have to do things for themselves. Um, you know, as a parent, I've experienced, you know, pain that my children have gone through. And, you know, the experiences they had, I wish they hadn't had. But I don't think I could have protected them from everything. My poor kids now, oh my goodness. I am, like, I, I was protective, but I'm, like, ten times more. Can't, where are you? What are you doing? Even, she's in college, you know, or Riley is in the next town over. She's gonna have a, a baby, another baby. So I'm like, I still, I'm that mom. And I have my two younger ones. This is what you can do, this is what you, you know. Cause I've, I've talked to people, you know. I've reached out to people. I, I'm curious, how did you become addicted and what, what led to this? You know, one person, one young man said, I was in college, I was a star, I, I got a scholarship. And he said I was in the lacrosse house and there was just one person. And I'm like, and he was the part, he's like, and I said so? He's like, yeah, he was a partier. And, he's, and he kept on offering things and um, he said, no, I, I'm not gonna do it. And he said, well, and he, the, the peer pressure. He tried once, he said, no, I, I'm fine, I'm, not, I'm gonna be all right. And then a little bit later he did, tried again and then said 10 years later here I am yeah yeah and that's you know that's how it goes you know sometimes we're willing to try it that one time yeah um, we're not willing up to willing to give up our lives for it yeah and a lot of times that's what gets taken from us yeah um, have you I believe you've gone out you've shared your story with other people I have um, you know you you've made it a point to to try to help when you can why do you do that? I don't want anybody to be me. I'm hoping that Andrew, hearing Andrew's story, hearing my story, hearing our family story of what life is now that he's gone, um, and the never ending nightmare and the, such pain and such loss, um, would maybe just say, okay, you know, Lisa's, Lisa does this. And I know a lot of people, and Andrew knew a lot of people, so I, I think people need to be um, hear his story. Yeah. You know. And I appreciate you sharing your story. Um, and I, I think a lot of people need to hear what it's like for a mom. Um, so I appreciate you doing what you're doing. Um, if, is there any one last message you'd like to give to either parents who are struggling today with, while their kids are using? or somebody who happens to be using today? I believe um, what we need to do and the county is we need to educate, educate, educate. Um, stop the stigma. Absolutely. We need to stop this stigma because people think that it cannot happen to them. We have doctors, we have lawyers, we have teachers, we have low income, high income. Addiction doesn't discriminate. We need to help everybody involved. We need to be able to get into the schools. I've tried to get into schools, only certain people can get into the schools. And that's not okay. You know, we'd be able, because addiction doesn't start at 21. It start, it can start at any age. And I wanted to just say this, I felt like when Andrew overdosed and stuff like that, and I, um, I met recovery, the recovery community, very welcoming, wonderful people just um, wonderful to be involved in that community and being able to speak at um, events and whatnot. You know, I just, again, I want to thank you for sharing your story. Um, I will not forget Andrew Mallett's story um, or yours. And uh, hopefully that, you know, somebody will hear this today and, and really get uh, the idea that recovery is possible. You know, and there's reasons for it. Um, you know, we all have moms. You know, 
know, that's one thing that we we all have, we all share. Um, and I know the pain that I caused my mom was not something I wanted for her. And, um, you know, thankfully, she was able to live her life uh, with me. So. Um, that's nice. Mm -hmm. That's nice to have. Because I'm proud of you. And I'm proud of the people in the community that are recovering. Because Andrew didn't, wasn't able to recover. But you are. And for today. For today, I know it's a day. That just hit me hard too. Yeah, yeah, and, oh. and it's important. I I always have it in my head, you know, that I am, you know, one bad decision away. Yeah. You know, from being there, and everything I do today is to make sure that I'm not. Yes. Um, and helping other people, uh, you know, has become my my goal, my purpose. So, uh, oh. thanks again, Lisa. Oh my goodness. That was, that for today really got me. Anderson's Auto Repair, locally owned and operated in New Sweden, Maine, specializes in all make, all model vehicle diagnosis and repair. Each individual service is backed by our nationwide TechNet, two-year, 24,000-mile warranty. Call or stop in to schedule an appointment today. Anderson's Auto, for wherever the road takes you. journey to discover the truth living life and recovery is lovely you got the power in you surround yourself with positive energy judges hitting people with provocative penalties need to make a change advocate to change the laws prove the people that it's not insane when you stand behind a cause i'm here to speak about the pain recover loud to normalize the disease that's been killing all my friends and my family the time is now to let it all go and recover loud the benefit is healthy people family and friends that never have to overdose ever again never have to plead out to a lesser offense i'm proud to say that i recover loud i never thought i could but i'm so proud that i discovered how to live my life again controlling my own destiny i needed recovery i still need it desperately addiction never defined my identity. i recover loud here to tell my own story i recover proud save a life of like 40 i recover loud yeah i recover loud i recover loud yeah i recover Recover that. I recover that. Here to tell my own story. I recover proud. Save a life of like 40. I recover loud. Yeah, I recover loud. I recover loud. Yeah, I recover loud. I recover. 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 I recover loud.